Hello and let's talk about the issues around Indian journalism raised by the death of Tarun Sisodia on Monday. The 37-year-old journalist with a Dhanik Bhaskar jumped to his death from the fourth floor of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He was recovering from COVID-19 and had undergone surgery for a brain tumour earlier this year. He was also reportedly suffering from depression. His family members say that he was experiencing pressure on the work front, though his employer has denied any allegations of harassment. There were also some concerns regarding some of its WhatsApp messages over the past few days, with many journalists calling for a probe into whether there was some foul play involved. An inquiry has been ordered into his suicide. While details of the case are yet to emerge, one thing is very clear. Indian journalism is facing a crisis. This specific case demonstrates one of the aspects of this crisis, that is the precarity and pressure experienced by journalists, many of whom strive every day to bring to us the truths that would otherwise never be told. In the aftermath of COVID-19, there have been dismissals, cutting of salaries and extensions of work hours for journalists. Journalist associations have organized against it, but they have limited scope considering the nature of the industry. We talked to journalist Bhasha Singh on these issues. Thank you, Bhasha, for joining us. So we heard the news of the tragic death of uh, Tarun Sisodia and he died by suicide, of course. And there's been a lot of uh, speculation going about it. There's been some good reporting also, which has pointed out the structural issues that actually are behind the death as well. So could you first start by telling us a bit about the context in which this has happened and also what his family is saying? Yeah. Uh, basically, thanks, uh, Prashant. And uh, it's very important that uh, in the national capital, when this kind of a tragic incident is, uh, has happened, uh, as you know that uh, Tarun uh, Sisodia, he was 37 years old, very young journalist, very energetic journalist. And he had a uh, brain tumor surgery also this year in February. And uh, then uh, again, he started reporting back. And we have seen very important reports uh, he has done. He was working in a national uh, daily, uh, Danik Bhaskar. And in, uh, through his reports, he was able to bring out that these are the real numbers of the COVID death because the government was claiming little less. And he uh, investigated and he brought that, no, the real number uh, from the mortuary to the uh, cremation grounds. He, moved and he brought that uh, data and then the government was forced to accept that more deaths are happening. So I'm just bringing this that the, uh, he was a very uh, enth enthusiastic uh, journalist he was and he was continuously in his report he was saying that if you get a corona you don't you should not be uh, depressed there are chances to recover blah blah all the things. So one scene one tragic incident this happened at a very prestigious uh, Ames hospital in Delhi, where uh, from the fourth floor on the 6th of July, he jumped and uh, Ames administration uh, said that it's a suicide. Police also said it's a suicide. The family has a deep concerns and the friends have a deep concerns because continuously he was writing that he uh, is under pressure and he's not being treated well and uh, many things uh, of that sort which anyhow we cannot uh, verify and which we cannot go but there is suspicion from the community uh, journalistic community so one thing is this but the important point which this death uh, relates to is to the condition in which uh, indian journalists are working uh, right now when we are talking uh, prasant you know that uh, more than 1000 journalists lost their jobs just in two months just in two months. And these are the journalists who we can put on the record, who uh, when the editions, are, be it Times of India, be it HT, be it Hindu, uh, Tribune, or uh, many newspapers. And uh, for the news channels, we don't know also that how many uh, is the India uh, Today group also. Uh, we know that many journalists have been asked to put their resignation. So this is also a very threatening condition for a journalist that officially they are not removed. They are asked that you resign so that we can give you uh, your uh, rest of the money and at least you can find some other job. Uh, and uh, there are uh, journalists union also who went to the court saying that all uh, these resignations and these uh, termination of the jobs should be uh, intervened into and the government and the um, judiciary should intervene and should uh, at least safeguard the journalist's right. Here in this case also, there are many people who are coming out and saying that he was threatened, he was under pressure, deep pressure of the job. 
because we know that uh, in this uh, group also many journalists were uh, asked to uh, put up their uh, resignation so the broader perspective is that during this period of corona when the whole media was just uh, coming out with very um, uh, all the news when the uh, prime minister narendra modi was saying that nobody should lose the job the migrant workers should be protected and he was saying that uh, the uh, people who are the owners or the employers should uh, um, uh, protect the job they should pay them the same media who was publishing and uh, giving the news about it they were the first one to uh, have a brutal attack on the uh, journalists like this their salaries and we know many of our friends uh, who are very reluctant to come out because in this media once you come out against your uh, owners your employer your institute it's almost impossible throughout your life to get any kind of a job in the media so this is a very grim uh, situation in within the media what they are reporting is something different but what the indian journalist is facing we have seen in delhi many senior journalists and the journalists who are associated with uh, very uh, important organizations uh, they were coming out they were uh, putting their uh, posts in the social media when they got corona positive that uh, we are not able to get uh, the treatment nobody is there to help them nobody is even ready the institute is not ready to even uh, get them tested the z uh, group uh, the way they behave with their employees so this shows this incident this tragic incident the tragic death and tragic suicide of uh, tarun sisodia links the whole thing that uh, uh, right now the indian uh, journalist is under huge pressure there is a huge depression there is a threat to his job to the life so i think this is the uh, broader uh, scene which uh, and the broader issues which uh, we need to uh, focus and uh, i think that uh, those who are in power in uh, important positions in the media uh, they should raise these issues and come out with some kind of a relief for a journalist who is anyhow uh, taking a risk to report right now nobody is ready to report no institution everybody is saying you work from home but if you are a reporter if you are not going to the field then how you are going to report all uh, the reporting is becoming on the secondary data so uh, i think uh, this is a very important juncture where the indian media is uh, standing uh, right. right and this is happening in some senses even as there is a larger assault on media which is speaking truth to power itself from the central government so that's one aspect but yeah. uh, to to flag two issues you raised one is the fact that there is of course a complete the the structural sort of issues that are happening in journalism where issues of pay issues of service issues of terms and of employment all of these happen in a very contractual basis there is no there is not much scope for unionization and or there is not much evidence of it on the ground and also what happens is that so there is no real way for journalists often to uh, unite and say take a stand when the employment when the employer takes decisions like this and on the other hand there is also the problem which you see many times before also that when journalists are sent out there is not enough equipment given to them in terms of protection so they are kind of sent out to bring stories which give glory to the organization but their health is at risk so on bo both these grounds specifically action does need to be taken yeah and at the same time uh, prashant uh, what you mentioned that if you report you report the truth the way uh, the state is coming uh, uh, is uh, is uh, so dangerous exactly. because there are fir's today uh, this uh, she long time uh, the journalist uh, senior editor uh, i was very young when i met her and i was so inspired by her work the way she was reporting in manipur and uh, from yesterday we are so much worried that the way the fir because she just posted on the facebook what has happened the way that it was uh, there was a attack on non tribals uh, who were play, playing basketball so patricia you see that uh, these are the incidents which rarely come to the national media the way it has happened to vinod duabe to the siddharth and to the scroll so uh, one side this has increased and uh, as you rightly said that there is nobody no structure is there who is going to address about any institute or any uh, setup 
where if uh, a journalist is uh, attacked a journalist is uh, laid off on the whatsapp group on the mail just that you we don't need your services where he or she is going to uh, get the justice where they are going to raise their voice so right now we all are on the contract uh, labor broadly the whole media is uh, right now running on a contract labor uh, thing so there is no security for your job there is no security for your life and because you want to uh, report so it's uh, okay that uh, you report and uh, we have seen i was with outlook we have seen many cases where on one story you will be having a defamation case and then you will be running up and down and after some time the institute will say okay it's your individual matter we are going to settle it off so these all uh, things are there so i think uh, this is the situation at the ground and tarun uh, sisodia's uh, tragic death raises a alarm as a alarming position where a person who is continuously writing that uh, how to fight with the corona how uh, to deal with and with such a young uh, kids uh, he has uh, the youngest daughter is 2 uh, month old so uh, and he commits the suicide so that shows that how much uh, a person is isolated gets isolated in uh, these kind of conditions so this is a very dangerous uh, situation which towards which we are uh, leading uh, right. thank you bhasha so much for talking to us thanks our next segment has to do with the rising covid-19 cases in the us with over 3 million cases and close to 134000 deaths the us is the most affected country in the world the response to this disease has been bungled from the start both by the donald trump administration and state governments the us is now seeing another surge with states like Texas, California and Florida among the worst affected. We talked to Dr. Hani Sarag, a Texas-based doctor and a member of the People's Health Movement on the steps that need to be taken. From a, a people's health perspective, what would be the essential steps that need to be taken? Of course, the United States is not a monolithic structure, there are many levels of government. But in terms of very basic steps right now, what would be some of the things you would suggest? Well, uh, there are I think there are two big categories here. One, during the pandemic, we need kind of social solidarity, we need kind of unity, and we need uh, um, kind of leaderships from activists to, to promote the uh, uh, public health values before profits and struggle against these measures from governments to stop. We need to slow down the spread till we have a, a, a vaccine or a treatment. And here it comes the second stage. Hopefully we will have a vaccine or a vaccine, let's say uh, not, 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 not a treatment, not a completely curative uh, uh, treatment, but most likely we're going to have a vaccine at some point uh, uh, maybe uh, available uh, early next next year so who's going to access it and this is a big the very big question as 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 well so the the member states of WHO refused um, a very legitimate suggestion from costa rica to have a public patent on uh, uh, any uh, uh, curative medicine or vaccines for COVID-19, and this was refused. So the refusal means, no, we're still putting it in the market uh, uh, place. And this is, uh, uh, this is quite uh, uh, scary because we may find us in a situation that those who can afford paying for uh, uh, the vaccine will exit. And actually, this happened. This is happening right now when Gilead um, had their uh, 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 treatment. Its price here, the, the 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 price per course here in the U.S. is four thousand two hundred uh, uh, dollars. And I know that it's not much cheaper in uh, other uh, countries. So this means that it will be affordable by the elites. And this is a treatment. If this applied to a vaccine, I hope that it will never happen 
Uh, but still, I think it's not going to be an easy thing, and it needs a lot of struggle, a lot of, a lot of unity, a lot of very high voice from uh, health activists to stop that. Right. Uh, and also, it will need some measures from progressive governments, if there are, to use flexibilities of uh, uh, trips to have compulsory licenses. If this happened, if they have the capacity to uh, produce it, because the, the, we have like five, con five companies in the whole world, they have capacity for mega mass production. So this means it's going to be monopolized uh, 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 somehow. After COVID, I hope that things will not return back to where they are when people can be outside and can be together again, I think this needs activists, not, not only health activists, but in general, politically active uh, uh, people to continue struggling for different world. Absolutely. We, we, we knew the COVID-19 exposed it naked. So we know exactly what capitalism means, what neoliberalism means, it's very clear right now. And COVID-19 with all what we have right now, including the climate change, including the, 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 um, uh, the uh, natural disasters, the increase in, in magnitude and so on, this is not the last thing. So we need to prepare ourselves as people in this world, to be able to deal with this differently and to put people's life, health and livelihoods and so on in front of uh, uh, profits. This is a long-term struggle, but I think it's, it's, um, it's needed more than ever right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani, for talking to us. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.